23 is the register of interests. It is simply to remind you uh, that we are obliged to keep our registers of interest up to date. So please inform Democratic Services of any changes uh, since the last session. We now come to the minutes, page one of your agenda, and following as I shall go through them, asking for any errors in the recording. Page one, I have... Sorry, that's a... I, I've, uh, I've indicated that I gave apologies for the last council meeting. Would, would you stand up, please? I gave apologies for the last council meeting. Thank you. Uh, I was just about to now so did Councillor Allen, so those two will be added to the, uh, the minutes of the last meeting. Any other issues on page one? Page two? Page three? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just on the re under resolved 1AI, Councillor Peter replaced by Councillor Graham Cohn as a member of the committee, but the, it also should follow on to say that Councillor Peter Topping replaced Councillor Graham Cohn as a substitute for that committee, essentially as a substitute. And not as a member, just as a substitute. Yes. As a substitute. Thank you, as a substitute member of that committee. Thank you, we note that, thank you. Anything else on page three? Page four? Page five? Page six? Page seven? Page eight? Page eight? Comes to the Bible. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just reading the um, minutes of uh, Councillor Chung Johnson's um, motion on um, domestic violence against women. Um, it's a little bit unclear as to what we're actually voting on there. So my recollection is that we were uh, voting to send it to Cabinet for consideration before it being voted on by full council. And I just wondered if we could just add a little uh, extra line to say that it was before we voted on it, so that anybody reading that wouldn't think that those who voted against the motion uh, sorry, voted against referring it to cabinet were actually voting against the substantive motion. <coughs> Thank you. You wish the addition of wording that it should then come back to the full council, is that what you're asking? Exactly. Is that actually what we agreed? And officers who took notice? I think all we agreed was to refer it to cabinet. Cabinet could do what it liked with it. So I think as it stands, the wording is clear. Um, but uh, if anyone wishes to second that amendment, you're very welcome to. Uh, yeah. comes? Not necessarily second. Well, uh, before we have any discussion, we must have a second, please. Okay, so I will second it for, for the discussion about Thank what you. happens subsequently. Is your, is your motion? No, we're not discussing what happens subsequently. We are only discussing whether at the time we specifically agreed it should come back to this council, having been discussed by government. My recollection is that we did not. Councillor, Councillor Bygod. Chairman, sorry, could I just uh, clarify what I meant? Uh, what I meant was that we were deciding not to uh, vote on the motion ourselves, but to refer to cabinet. That was my recollection. That, that is exactly what the wording says. The chairman moved that as the motion might have resource implications, it should be referred to cabinet. Yes, but that doesn't say that we were choosing uh, not to vote on it then. It just uh, reads to me that we were actually voting against the motion. Do we have a second for the proposal that this wording is unclear? Councillor Topping, thank you. I think we can simply take that to a vote. Those who would support uh, the proposal that we amend this wording, uh, please press the... Oh, we want discussion. Councillor. Very brief point, that, that if it applies to that motion, does it not apply to the other motions that were raised and then um, uh, referred on because of the uh, subsequent amendment to the Thank you. Uh, Councillor Topping. Thank you, Chair. In um, 
Secondly, with this motion, I, I think the point that we're struggling to try and
Uh, can't you come to the Clayton, I think, as well. <laughs> uh, yes, please. I really need to wear my spectacles. <laughs> you do? Yes. Councillor Bygott, are you happy with that? Uh, I'm happy with that, too. Thank you. Right, so now we have uh, a motion that for all of these uh, motions, where the wording is, the chairman moved that, blah, 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 uh, that should be in bold. Can we now go to a vote? Yes. Can we do that by affirmation? Uh, is everyone yes. happy with that? Yes. Thank you. With that amendment, we moved on. We move on to page nine. Page 10. Page 11. Page 12. Page 13, page 14, page 15, page 16, page 17, page 18, page 19, page 20. Chairman. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. At page 20 and 21, there is... Um, uh, wording about both my input into it and Councillor Hart's input into that discussion. Um, it fails to actually um, say how angry uh, that discussion became, well never mind. Uh, however, uh, the accusation that was made against me uh, by Councillor Hart, uh, with very little knowledge uh, at her beck and call to actually um, claim such things, was then at the end of that meeting um, sorted out by her coming back to the group to the uh, council meeting and making a full apology to me. I would like to see, in fact I request that that is also put in, that I have an apology. That is already, order please. That is already in the minutes at item 16. So oh. I do not think we need to make this change. One. Thank you very much. Good Thank to you. remind everybody. <laughs> Page we'll 21. Try with me again in a hurry. Order. Could you switch off your microphone? Councillor Roberts. Page 21, page 22, page 23, page 24, page 25. I hope there are no amendments there. Is everyone happy to accept these minutes as an accurate record with the amendment proposed and agreed as an accurate record of the meeting uh, we had last time? Thank you. I am hopeful, incidentally, now that we are recording the meetings, that the minutes might become a little less extensive in future. We come to item five announcements, and I have a couple of announcements to make. Firstly, it is a relief and a pleasure in equal measure. No, I think it's a greater pleasure than a relief, but it is certainly a relief to welcome our new Chief Executive, Liz Watts. We've been looking forward to you for a long time. We are very grateful to you for filling the huge gap. Thank you. I would like to thank Mike Hill, formally, for taking over the role in the interregnum, and I would like to ask him to come and accept, as a tiny token, a written thanks from the Council for what you have done. Mike. which could promote involvement in the development of the local plan. We are anxious 
to have as many people as possible in our communities involved in this plan. And so please, can you tell comms of any events through which we might identify and advertise the fact that we want people to be involved? Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, so I would also uh, like to welcome our new Chief Executive, who has had to hit the ground running this week, um, and I know is going to be fabulous. Um, I'd also like to thank Mike and all the other members of staff who have had to step up, and they are numerous, and they have done so uncomplainingly, willingly, enthusiastically, and have really helped keep this ship on track. So I'm extremely grateful to all concerned. Thank you very much.
the board and their committees are going to function. Um, they had some reservations about the, uh, the project. One of them was that the housing company delivering, I think, used to be the North Hearts housing company. Uh, they didn't want to talk about what the reservations are, uh, but I got them in the end to agree it in principle, subject to a few issues being clarified in two weeks' time at the housing committee. Um, on, uh, there was a de debate about public transport to serve Alcambry. You'll be aware that the combined authority officers is there, are there and quite a lot of the officers serving the county council are going to be moving to Alcambry. Uh, the project to put a railway station there has been ditched. Um, I gather the cost of the railway station was going to be about 30 million, but the full track to serve it was going to be 190 million and that money isn't forthcoming. So there's now a, a problem about how not only officers working at the county council get to our country, but how our residents get there if they need to engage with the county council. Um, so Councillor Count, the leader of the county council, um, spoke at length about the responsibility of GCP to deliver sustainable transport or public transport to Alcambry, and which he claimed had fallen off the GCP um, you know, register, and uh, he's going to be endeavouring to re rekindle that. So we wait and see what happens there. And then uh, there was a paper on the European Union Exit Capability Programme. Now, the combined authority has been given quite a lot of money from BEIS, B E I S, um, the business body for government, uh, to support local businesses through Brexit or not Brexit or whatever it turns out to be. Um, so they've put together a sort of programme of activities. Um, I'm a bit concerned that you know, we're also doing work here, so I did ask that this paper come to our Brexit Advisory Committee and that the officer responsible, which is John T. Hill, that he comes to our Brexit Advisory Committee and talks about what the combined authority is going to do so that we can make sure that anything that we commit to is additional and not conflicting with uh, what the combined authority is going to do. Thank you very much, Nida. Um, Councillor Hailings, do you wish to add anything from the overview and scrutiny committee? No. Are there any questions, please? Thank you. I will take questions as they come and then ask for an, an answer afterwards. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, I'd like to ask the leader. Um, she said that the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership should be contributing towards. Uh, the link between Orkenbury and Cambridge, which we know is served, partially served by the guided bus, most of the route is there. Surely that is wrong because the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership money should only be spent in South Towns and Cambridge, and the money should not go outside those two, the city and that district. Thank you. I'll take all the questions first and then the leader can answer. Uh, Councillor Toppy, do you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, my understanding is that there was a meeting with Homes England uh, in the last couple of days at which the combined authority was represented, not least by Councillor Smith. And I wonder if um, that good news, uh, she can elaborate a little more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hazel Smith. My question. Um, in regard to the overview of the scrutiny committee minutes, um, they seem to have come up with um, a large number of very good questions to pose to the board, and um, we don't seem to have the answers to all those questions. Where should we look for the answers to all those questions? It's all very well to show us the questions they've come up with, but uh, we need the answers as well. Thank you. Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Wright is absolutely right. Um, and in fact, I was going to point out that uh, Alcantara is not in the Great Cambridge Partnership area. So therefore, um, does the leader believe that this is an attempt by the combined authority to uh, take over the Great Cambridge Partnership? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Leader. 
had a chance to digest, at least in a preliminary fashion, the proposal that is to be brought before us. Councillor Solomon. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, first, we would very much like to thank the IRP for their hard work this year. Um, we did set them a bit of a challenge uh, after, after last year where we felt that uh, we wanted to see more evidence behind their recommendations. And I think we do see this year that there is more evidence in support of their, their recommendations. And broadly speaking, we, we uh, would like to propose accepting those, those recommendations. Um, with a couple of, of uh, clarifications or uh, subject to uh, laid out in, in point two of the uh, motion. So the first is just a clarification on the, on the deputy leaders, uh, special responsibility allowance, and that is in the, in the wording of the report that was listed as the deputy leaders. That is just for clarity, you know, we call the deputy, the statutory deputy leader. And then also, we, we felt that though there was good evidence base, the, there seemed to be a little bit of a, a, a question mark in our mind around the work that is put in by the uh, chair and vice chair of the, the scrutiny and overview committee. Uh, particularly as last year we changed to uh, model of pre-scrutiny um, and we don't see that, that that is reflected in the, the recommendations made by the uh, by the panel. So just to urge request that they urgently maybe go and take another look at that. Alongside that there is a proposal for uh, members of the planning committee to receive uh, their own special allowance. Just to recognise that there is actually another planning committee that South Cambridgeshire is involved in the joint planning committee with the city. And so to also have a look at that and make a recommendation. But aside from those, that clarification and those requests to take another look at a couple of specific issues, we're, I'm proposing we accept the, the recommendations as made by the IRP. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have a second? Councillor John Batchelor, do you wish to speak now or at the end of the debate? Yes, I am happy to second it and I reserve my right to speak at the end, please. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And just a clarification, two, uh, subsection two means that we're asking them to do some more work and that will be brought back to a subsequent meeting of this council. So at the moment we are accepting their recommendations as per item three and then asking for the issues under item two. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. I'm afraid I can't go along with this. We are in a situation where that scrutiny committee recently, when the question of the planning problems arose, one of the things that we were told was that we've got a problem because we're fighting against the private sector and what they can pay out to staff. Whatever you give yourself as a rise here, we'll see the headline in the Cambridge Evening News, as councillors give themselves a rise. People won't actually particularly partake in seeing how much we are awarding ourselves, if we do, but they will see it as a rise. They will see it as a rise at a time when we are actually not providing good service. The planning committee is concerned, many of us are concerned, the fact that the uh, offices are demoralised. I understand that the offices have been told to not talk to us, not tell us things. Secret squirrels abide and are bound around here, it would seem. So, no, I'm sorry, I'm speaking. I accept that point. Would you please not refer to uh, officers uh, I'm not the way that you have? Thank you, Chairman, but I would just say or that I'm, I'm not talking about officers um, in particular or naming anybody. It's a well worth known fact. It's been in the Cambridge Evening News. And uh, Councillor Roberts, it is not a well known fact. 
and I ask you please not to make such accusations. Okay, I'll write to the Cambridge Evening News instead. Um, I, I would just say that, that here we go, uh, here we go again, um, thinking that we can give ourselves a rise, and they're, they're not enormous, I, I take it that they're not enormous. However, at a time when especially the opposition and its members of parliament are telling us what dire straits the country is going to be in shortly, it's not the time to be giving ourselves any extra bonuses. It's a great privilege to be on this council. We're not on it to be taking largesse from people who we say are going to be in financial difficulties shortly. I don't agree with that. However, that's the common theme from the Liberal Democrats in particular. So, I will not be voting for it. I'm sure it will get through, because I'm sure all the Liberal Democrats will vote for it. However, I think you will actually do so at your peril, because I think that the members of the public have very, very low opinions of politicians of whatever ilk they are at this moment in time. And I don't think taking their money, it's not the council's money, it's the public's money, and taking anything more from the purse of the public at times like this is actually, frankly, unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Uh, Councillor Thank you, Chair. I'm speaking purely on the motion that Councillor Solomon has put forward. Um, we may well have a wider debate um, which will give us the opportunity to explore some of the things that Councillor Roberts has um, quite rightly put forward. But I'm spoken, speaking particularly on the motion and I can't help thinking, well, what a difference a year makes. Because about a year ago, in fact, perhaps almost precisely a year ago, Councillor Solomon, like a latter-day Savonarola, full of milk and water asceticism, stood up and put a motion round in the way that he's done, which was directly opposite to what he's saying today, and said, you know, well, it's important that we set ourselves standards and that we recognise that the officers are getting 2%, and therefore his motion um, denied the opportunity to... Um, uh, <coughs> to partake in the bounty of the remuneration panel. And so what I see before me here is a sort of cherry picking. I mean, I personally have points where I disagree fundamentally with the remuneration panel. But I'm not going to sort of put forward a motion saying, well, how about a bit of this and a bit of that? That's the point. They are independent whether we like their views or not. So I won't be voting for uh, Councillor Solomon's motion. And as I say, I don't know who uh, what's happened to him in the last year. Perhaps he might need people to help canvass and campaign for him. I don't know. But I won't be voting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Helps. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can't support this. Um, I can't support this for one reason. We recently made people redundant. And I can't ever meet somebody who was made redundant from this fantastic organisation and say, yes, we've now just increased our own salaries and our own allowances. So that is something I can't do in the street. I can't face them and look at them in the street and say, we made you redundant and now we're putting up our wages. Um, we made people redundant because of a variety of reasons, but the principle one we've always used, and that's certain enough, is that we have to cut our costs. And I can't then see me justifying taking that money and then have to say to somebody, how is the job hunting going? Thank you. Councillor Mills. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to uh, just rebuff uh, Councillor Howell's uh, remarks. We are not paid wages, we are paid on allowances. And in fact, that leads me to my other point, which was to mention uh, to Councillor Roberts if she's uh, going to write to the papers and uh, inform them of our massive for allowances and the raises that we're awarding ourselves, just to include the calculation I did on my own 
uh, rates per hour, which was in round figures one pound an hour. So two percent on top of that, I think I can do that. I'm going to board the chairman. We're not paid a wage, as I was just pointed out, therefore that's one pound an hour except for our hours. Can I remind members if they wish to produce a point of order, they should indicate which part of the, uh, the Constitution they are referring to. I don't want it to be used simply as a way of objecting to what other speak speakers say. My apologies, Chair. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, so, focusing just on what's put in front of here, there's so many elements of this that are still uncomfortable, and I'm sure we'll get on to more of that when we come to the actual motion. But the fact that my understanding is currently you can be in receipt of one special allowance and to increase that to two, when in some cases that means, you know, we look at some of these special allowances at £5,000, the new ones, and at this point in time, I think the increases as a whole are unacceptable and therefore what's put in front of us by Councillor Solon, just, it's still not good enough and so I won't be voting for it. Thank you. Just to clarify, the substantial mo motion before us is precisely what is on the sheet that was circulated uh, a little while ago. So far we have had... Uh, <coughs> Sorry, Chair. I, could you clarify that for me? My understanding is Councillor Solomon has put forth an amendment. His amendment to the recommendation, which is in Appendix A, is precisely what is on the sheet that was circulated a little while ago. Well, there, is, there is no amendment. This is the motion based on a report which was given to us, which was, what, which was not itself uh, a motion produced by a member of this council. Is that clear? We have had that. Point of clarification, sorry, we all have to submit notice of motions and have to a certain deadline. What time was it said that it's the first we've seen that it's not an amendment to substantive motion? This is a, an item of business that is all on the agenda. The point is normally that recommendations come from committees that the end could put forward to council. Uh, this is the report of an independent person which requires someone to move a motion, um, it, it is acceptable in the manner in which it is done, but it's not an amendment, to be careful. This is the motion. I, I would like myself clarity. We have not had an amendment to this proposal, this motion which was produced by um, Councillor Solomon, uh, and I just would like clarification, if we reject this motion, uh, what happens to the approval of uh, allowances for the coming year. Well, there's two options. You can ask for a new motion, or it's the status quo as to what has been made upon. Thank you. Is that clear to everyone? Um, okay. Yes. Um, thank you. Councillor Wright, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think we are confused by this because you didn't put the lead, the lead of the opposition right in what he said earlier. Um, so we thought we were debating an amendment rather than a substantive motion. Um, so that's where the doubt is coming. And perhaps you could allow some leniency for us to take it as a the motion now. The lead, quite, the lead of the opposition quite clearly said you know, what he was doing. And that wasn't corrected at the time. So that has caused some confusion. Thank you. I'm slightly surprised that senior members of this council are <coughs> confused by a process which we have every year, uh, and uh, not just for this item, but a large number of items. Um, if there is any more uh, debate needed, or if anyone wishes to propose an amendment, uh, yes, I am prepared to accept that now. But that does not seem to be the case. Can we go to the vote then, please? Uh, and I, I had not seen any hands. Um, yeah. Councillor Ellington. Thank you. I think my concern, I have many concerns about this. One of them is the uh, opportunity for 
uh, and people to have two uh, remunerations for uh, being on different committees, which has never been the case in this council previously. Um, when I was chairman, I was also on the, a number of committees and was not allowed uh, to take any extra. Um, this results in the leader um, of the council being paid an additional £5,000 for being on the um, uh, combined authority, as well as other remunerations for other items. It, in, it is a, a way of not paying basic uh, members of their basic remuneration increase, but by paying everybody else for uh, being chairman, vice chairman, substitute members, advisory members, any other sort of member, um, but not actually for, for just being a basic member. It makes it somewhat discriminative, and I am very aware of the Liberal Democrat uh, proposal when I was proposed as an additional cabinet member in May 2017, my colleagues were required to reduce their remunerations so that I could be paid a remuneration. It's funny how the world changes depending where you sit. Councillor Wright, you've already spoken, but I will allow you to speak again. That's very kind of you, Chairman, and that's much appreciated. I am very unhappy with this proposal. Since 2007, this council has seen austerity, particularly our staff. And as councillors, since that time, we have matched the pay rises our staff have had with our allowances. And that seemed right, fair and proper. And a few of you will think back a year or two when the county council did this, there was outrage, and quite rightly so, in my view. Um, and I was reminded of it time and time again, every time I picked up a Liberal Democrat leaflet before this last election. Every time. One of your three points you push every time. So, could you, you know, refer I'm, your remarks to the chair, please, and not get into political debate? Sorry, Chair. So, looking at this, where are we? We're going down the route that the county council went down, and through you, Chairman, the public and members of the opposition won't forget that. Thank you. Councillor Kate. Oh, Councillor Kerr. Thank you, Chairman. And I just wanted to say, really, that my stance is exactly the same as it was last year, that and councillors' rises should be exactly the same as that of officers and staff. And as someone that works in the public sector, I know that often those rises are quite small, but we should be seen to be replicating those, those rises, not trying to push through rises through the back door, and in, a, in my opinion, unscrupulous way. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, a, it's a really difficult question, this, because if we're going to go, go to days where kind of gentlemen who can afford to represent their communities and don't need any allowances yeah. are to, to represent, supposedly represent the people in, in their constituencies, then we have then we have a self-selecting group of people coming forward to represent communities. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that people, you know, having been on the scrutiny committee myself, I recognise how hard the chair and vice chair chair work, uh, and that there's recognition for that. However, I work in the you know, voluntary sector, and so know I'm aware of how many unpaid carers, people taking on unpaid responsibilities within our communities that are really, really valuable. 
and affect a lot of people's lives, and they don't have any allowances. They don't, they don't get any of that, that argument covered. So it's a really difficult debate. I, I'm not going to be able to support it today. Not because I don't, not because I think that, that uh, councillors, as chairs and vice chairs, don't warrant um, an allowance. But it's, it's just how, how does it look, and how, how can we, how can we come up with a remuneration system that actually considers? I mean, it, people have to go through means testing, right, to get benefits and the rest of it. So. Is there some way of revamping the remuneration committee to look at? I mean, there are people here who, who joined the universal credit um, debate motion that I have been talking about that their, their latest Tesla bloody car that they were all, excuse me, Tesla car that they were all drinking. Now, if we've got people with that ex extremity of income, maybe there's a case to say, okay, let's be honest about who is representing communities here. If they're big landowners who can afford to be here without needing to draw on another. Let's acknowledge that. If they're, if they're single parents with kids who have, and they have care responsibilities, let's acknowledge that. And let's make the remuneration actually reflect the people who sit in these chairs. And hopefully then we might get a reflection of the people that we're representing out there. We might get different people feeling able to, 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 to take a stand and get involved in politics and find themselves here uh, talking in this way. Thank you. There has been no proposal for an amendment, so I propose we go to the vote. Uh, Councillor Solomon, would you like to come up with this? Can I speak? Councillor Solomon, would you wish to speak first? No, Councillor Batchelor then. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I won't detain you long. Just with a couple of points here. Um, you recall that in 2017 we reduced the number of councillors from 57 to 45. In the 2018 allowances, no account whatsoever was taken of this extra work that we have to take on. And I might say, in this very modest uh, proposal before us, we still don't take any significant note of the additional work that we are obliged to take on. I would also um, emphasize the point that this actually provides a saving of some 60,000 pounds a year ongoing um, which can be used uh, for the benefit uh, of the general um, uh, electorate. Uh, we've also done our best with the special re responsibility allowances to put that on a firmer footing with uh, a review of the hours actually put in and an analysis of that. Um, we've gone some way with that, but it would have been a great help if the Conservative group had actually taken part as well, so um, unfortunately they chose not to, so there are various missing elements to that. Other than that, I'd say again that this is a, a modest um, proposal, uh, and it also fixes the situation for the next couple of years, so that hopefully we don't have to go through all this. But underlying it, I mean, we shouldn't be put into this position. Uh, allowances, we shan't, shouldn't be in a position where we actually have to um, uh, you know, set our own allowances. This ought to be a national policy, um, and we should be, have some direction. Should we ever get a decent government to show us uh, what we ought to be getting? Uh, I recommend this and hope you will vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask members in the future please not to make political comments and not to refer to other political parties. We will now go to the vote. <laughs> you have had a chance to speak already, Councillor Topping, so... Point of clarification. You may. I'm not aware of any communication by the leaders' discussions which we have from time to time inviting the Conservative group to take part in the exercise which Councillor Manchin Thank you. We will now go to the vote. If you approve the motion which is before us, which I remind you is what is written on the extra sheet 
that was circulated at the beginning of this of the debate on this item. If you approve that, you press the green button. If you reject it, you press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you press the yellow button. Has everybody voted? May we see the result? Twenty-two have approved, twelve have objected, and four have abstained. We therefore approve the uh, IRP's uh, proposals with the modifications, uh, the amendments made uh, on the sheet which was presented to us. Thank you. We move to item 10. Membership of committees and outside bodies. Uh, this is outlined on page Roman 2 of your agenda. Your attention is drawn to the changes in membership of committees as set out on page two. You will see that there is a change in the composition of the cabinet, which you are asked to note. The council is also asked to note and endorse changes in membership of committees as set out at paragraph 10b of your agenda. However, I believe that there are two further changes not noted in the proposals there, namely, that Councillor Nigel Cathcart is replacing Councillor Gavin Clayton on the Scrutiny and Overview Committee, and Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton is replacing Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson as a substitute member of the Cambridge Fringes Joint Development Control Committee. Do group leaders wish to notify the Council of any other changes <coughs> of membership of committees? Thank you. Um, you might, well, I hope you're aware that the Combined Authority has had three committees for some time now. Um, one thing I should have mentioned earlier when I was talking about the Combined Authority is that the, these committees are going to change. Currently, there are, I think, three representatives from the board on each of the Skills, Transport and Housing Committee. These are going to change as part of the constitutional uh, review yesterday, which means that there will be representation from all partner councils on each of those committees. And those committees are now, instead of just being sort of sounding boards, are now going to have delegated decision making and delegated spend to them. So some, some decisions will be made at committee level and others will be made at board level. So that therefore means that we have a place on the Housing, the Transport and the Skills Committee. So currently I am the person, uh, and so it's in my gift, who, who, um, who sits on those, and if I choose to I can have all three of them, but I'm choosing not to. Uh, so I will have the Housing Skills Committee and Councillor Hazel Smith will be my sub. Uh, Councillor in Van der Weyer will be on the Transport Committee and Councillor Neil Goff will be his sub. And uh, as currently is the case, Councillor Ian Wilson will be on the Skills Committee and Councillor Neil Goff will be her sub as well. Thank you, Councillor Topping. Do you have anything to say for your group? Thank you. Um, I take it that the Liberal Democrats, the, uh, the Labour Party, has no further changes to report. Thank you. Are there any changes in membership of outside bodies to report? No. Uh, we note those changes then and endorse them. We come now then to questions from councillors, which are on pages 3 to 4, Roman 3 to 4 of your agenda. You are reminded that there is a period of 30 minutes for these questions. This includes those questions where notice has been provided and on the agenda. And if there is still time, notices, uh, uh, sorry, questions which have been put into the box prior to the start of this item. Were there any? Mm -hmm. No. So it's just the questions before us. Uh, question number one comes from Councillor Ellington. Councillor Ellington, would you pose your question, please? Thank you. As on your paper. Thank you. Who's going to take this one? Councillor Ellington. Thank you. Um, there is no specific requirement in section 106, I agree, as 
far as understanding to seek heal and conclusion for any specific faith, just say faith. And actually, if I can quote you the schedule uh, in 11, which defines faith voluntary groups as any faith voluntary or community group which this council or the town council uh, sees as relevant has approved to use the allocated land. Now, it's a small parcel of land, it's 0.25 acres, hectares, sorry, um, and very little funds to build anything on it. That's our understanding. Now, it would be difficult to cater for a specific faith. So, what is going on now is that the, um, uh, the community's team is currently in discussions with the various faith groups that have an interest in Rockstone. And the idea is to come up with a strategy that will work for them all, including looking at the possibility of other community spaces coming on other phases. Um, I can't give you a date as to when that will be finished, but what I can promise is that when there is something to tell you, I will tell you. Thank you, Councillor Ladies and Gentlemen. Do you have a supplementary question? Thank you. I'd just like to um, uh, quote from a letter I, that has been sent to me, but to us as a council, from uh, the Reverend Dr. Ben Cope, who is actually sitting in our gallery. She is the Pioneer Minister of North Stowe, and she makes various points, and I'm, I'm really delighted to see that on Tuesday of this week, uh, an action was taken to start that conversation that you're describing. Um, and those groups with an interest in this land um, can find a workable way forward. But she also raises a number of really important points, which I think the council as a whole would find useful to have in their heads. Um, to optimise community development and cohesion, residents of all faiths and none need to be able to exercise their freedom of expression to worship and study according to their distinct cultural heritage. Such freedom helps build trust and allows open, respectful, multi-faith dialogue. Both groups are already demonstrating they can work well together for the good of the wider community. But worshipping in the same physical space poses significant practical challenges. For example, different religions have very different attitudes to alcohol. Muslims would abstain, while many Christian denominations use wine in their central community communion services. Food. Some religions require vegetarianism or halal meat, or worship as mixed genders or worshipping as mixed genders. Worship and the out-worshipping of faith is not something limited to a few hours in one week, day a week, where there are needs for daily acts of worship, timetabling shared worship space becomes a challenge, with the festival calendars of many religions being based on the seasons several times a year will see conflicting needs in terms of festivities. For some, but not all people of faith, their worship space is an area set aside for encounter with their God. So it would be disrespectful to enforce the worship of such gods in that space. Freedom of expression should allow worship with suitable religious symbols around them. Many people turn to religious buildings in times of crisis, grief, joy and celebration, marking weddings, births and funerals, helping people put down roots in a town and a community, developing stability. We need to make sure these provisions are appropriate and aligned with different cultural requirements, e.g. distinctly Hindu or Christian as well as civic weddings. Councillor Ellington, I think, the, I think this is an important letter but these issues are all well known. I'd be grateful if you come to your question, please. Right. Yes, I will say that I will be very happy to um, circulate that letter if anybody would like it. My question is, can you be absolutely sure that my colleague Shrabana uh, and her Hindu faith will be included in your discussions? 
Sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm a person of faith myself, so I understand uh, the points that have been made. And part of the discussion that will be going on hopefully will be with groups that are similar to those of Councillor Bhattacharya. Uh, I don't know who is in within this discussion that's going on, but I'm happy to sit with the officers and make sure that we look at uh, you know, the effects that are available in the area. And if people like yourself want to participate, then I'm sure that can be um, taken on board as well. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, would you raise your question? Thank you, Chairman, as is written. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, um, thank you. I think, if I understand correctly, your question is actually referring to the actual planning application fees, not a validation fee. And if that is the case, then I'll just say this that the council receives 80% of its applications online. And there is a calculator that enables people to calculate what is the right amount of fees to pay. And they have to submit this at the same time as the application of the West Coast Register. The other way to submit the application is manually, and you can pay by sending a check or card with the phone. But the technical support team are the ones who do the application and they check the application to make sure the right fee is paid. Okay. Now, you'll be aware that we just brought together two teams from Gilbo um, and um, Campbell. And they recently carried out a technical workshop, I believe, looking at the whole wider validation process. Um, and that process includes a uh, you know, supervisory role in making sure that the right fees um, are paid. So, um, I don't know that anything has missed or people have not paid um, the right fee. But what I know is if the right fee has been paid, the application doesn't move forward. It has to be the right fee. Okay. Now, it may be that you have done some uh, investigations and that has turned up something. Obviously, I will be uh, happy to hear what that has surfaced, but I hope it is the right figure. Not the one figures that were printed like in the last article in the papers and the weekend. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Do you have a supplementary? I do have a supplementary. Um, my question was around because the brief notice that was being given about TerraQuest was that validation would be happening by TerraQuest, not our officers. So it was seeking clarification that somebody in the council would be supervising that. There's no reference made, and was the lead planning member confident that the mechanisms were in place and that we would not lose money? It's good to hear that she feels so confident that it's all there. That wasn't what was being asked. It was going forward. Uh, thank you. If that was what you meant, then please make sure that the question says what you actually really meant. Okay? Um, Point my order, Chairman, in that there's several, several For a point of order, rates. I need to know the, what part of the okay. institution to which you are referring. 11.7a, direct oral answer. The insinuation of myself in the, in the news piece or anything else is not a direct answer to the context of this question. If the question was misunderstood, I apologise, it will now be answered. Councillor Dr. Uh, thank you, Chair. My first statement was what the question was about, was it not? Um, TerraQuest actually run the planning portal. So, uh, we are currently in discussions with them as to how the process will work. They are good at what they do. But the, the, the processes that we're going to be putting in place will have supervision by after. That is important to us because that is the only way we can know whether or not what we put in place is working. So I can assure you that we will be supervising that work. We have to measure it, set a baseline, and measure it so that we can say that it is working. If there's anything else, I'll have to take it outside of this. Thank you.
wants to know how it works. I'll bring them, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Could we have a little less of the body language, please? Hmm. <laughs> um, what I'd like to say to uh, Councillor Howard is this. I believe this is an operational question. It's an operational issue. Okay? But I'll answer the best I can. Um, and if that is not still sufficient, then I suggest we take this outside of this meeting. The shared service, shared planning service, is moving to a new workflow process. Okay? Uh, we currently invested, or will be invested, about £200,000 in a new ICT um, system to help us process applications more efficiently. Now, part of the assessment that was made um, and benchmarking with other services shows that... I'm so sorry, Chairman, I have a few ideas in the letter. Not to let anybody I'm getting to why the letter was sent. You either want to hear it no, no, or you don't. The content of it. May I uh, suggest, Dr. Hawkins, that you limit yourself to the question raised, which is, are you satisfied with that letter? Thank you, Chairman. I'm satisfied with the letter. HR and planning service went through the right process. And the same process that was undergone with the shared waste service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Howard, do you have a something? Surprisingly, I do, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, um, I have been approached um, with somebody who received one of these letters, one of the planning officers. They found the letter to be, in their opinion, curt, insensitive, uh, insensitive, sorry, and they felt very, very unappreciative. This is quite troubling, Chairman, and the reason that it is troubling is this particular officer, who has been here for a number of years, uh, is now deciding that they've had enough, and this is the final straw. It wasn't so much the content of the letter and what the letter actually said, it was the fact that they did feel appreciated. Chairman, I just feel Thank you. I don't think we can discuss individual cases. Okay. And uh, it has already been suggested this is an operational matter, and I think we probably ought to take it outside this meeting. You've uh, made your point, I think. Chairman, all I'm asking is all staff, I'm not saying about the, any particular. I think we need to be careful of staff, as I said earlier on, Chairman. Our staff are the most valuable asset, or well, maybe that's what I referred to. I think it's a wonderful place to work for, Chairman, and I believe we're not helping matters at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Hawkins, do you wish to respond to that? I will. Um, if I had been allowed to finish the statement I was making earlier on, you would have heard that we appreciate the service that those members of staff uh, have rendered. There is a reason for the contract letter they were given, and it's a fixed term contract. They're helping us to move forward into the new planning system. I'm happy to discuss with you outside. I'm not going to go any further with this in here. But we appreciate them. I'm sorry for those who say we can't stay. There are those who are staying. But we have to move forward. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs, on the paper. Thank you. There is one dedicated appeals officer in this building. Um, we understand that that has potentially created issues uh, in the past, especially if the person is away or uh, whatever, or whether we have uh, peak in workloads. Um, obviously, the reason we're bringing together the two uh, services is to build resilience in the service. So going forward, we're hoping to have uh, two dedicated appeals officers. Thank you. Councillor Waters, do you have a supplementary question? Thank you. Um, how can we expect to win the planning appeal and therefore avoid designation if the council does not put in resources? Thank you. Councillor 
Um, if memory serves me right, the way in which we um, run appeals was changed under previous administration. We used to have a dedicated planning officer, not a support officer, and that was changed. So we haven't had a dedicated planning officer for appeals for a long time. The officer that has been responsible for that particular case sits in with the barrister on the appeal and does the work together with the technical support appeals officer. So we put in the resources that we need to to win appeals. We've just sat through, I think it's what, four weeks of the Agritech appeal, and I wish we'd be able to attend even if just one of those to see just how brilliantly Marty worked and the information that, worked, that was provided um, to the inspector. So I have no doubt whatsoever that we are capable of defending appeals and we will put in resources that we need to put in. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. Vice President Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Can I just clarify one thing first? You have the phrase reduction in numbers. There are six members of the enforcement team as we speak. Only one of them is leaving. And that will be at the end of October. <coughs> we have a vacancy, which is a new vacancy in the new joint service, which is for the leader, team leader of the enforcement and section 106. Um, I'm sorry that that person is leaving. He's done good work for us, and I wish him well uh, for the future. Um, but I am confident that going forward, we will continue to robustly, which is what you asked me, um, enforce planning conditions. Um, as you are no doubt aware, I chaired the meeting on the 28th of August about enforcement issues in North Sea. And having written to the, I emailed all the developers, um, how was the weekend before the meeting? And they all turned up. So I had a full house. The meeting was with us, officers, local members, and the developers. And we ironed out issues. We had a follow up meeting in a week's time. So, as far as NOSTA is concerned, I can assure you that we will continue to robustly enforce those conditions. And <coughs> we will be recruiting to the positions that become available. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I very much regret that the lead member has taken it down to an individual, and that wasn't my intention with my second question. <coughs> Uh, I was take, talking about the enforcement team. We have an outstanding enforcement team in this authority. You know, for many years since I've been a councillor, particularly the early ones, you know, they were putting their lives on the line on some of the jobs they did. And Councillor Roberts will remember that, and some of the other councillors who, who uh, have been here a long time. They are to be cherished and supported. And it's that lack of support that this administration has given them, Chairman, um, that concerns me. And there are plenty of examples of that throughout this process of putting the two services together. Um, comments were made in the consultation that were not followed up, and I regret that that has uh, resulted in a really low morale in the team. Um, and my supplementary question to uh, the lead member is that um, you know, with the mileage allowances being cut, uh, and how are the enforcement team going to get to this uh, when there's a three week waiting list for the zip car that this council owns? Thank you for that. Can I just say, first of all, that when the previous administration decided to go to a joint service, we were not consulted as far as I can remember. It was just on us. Um, I'm standing. Now, we have tried our best 
to put together this new service. The planning director and the HR director have followed the guidelines and the rules and sent to the letter. As for the original team, you know, the operational side of things, obviously, I need to give to them. We haven't cut, as far as I know, we haven't cut mileage. There has been a misunderstanding of what is to be. Now, again, without referring to specific operational issues, the issue of mileage is the same thing that was approved by the council with the unions for the shared waste space. So what HR have done is apply the same principle to the new joint service. Now obviously you have this understood certain things and as far as I understand, the clarification will be given to them within the next week. As, as of this afternoon. Now, as far as zip cars go, or cars to, there is one. But then, we want to improve the service, we've just finished the merging, let us get our feet on the table and make sure that we understand what the requirements are, what they need, and then we can move forward to provide them with those tools. And frankly, uh, if I may, Chairman, I did offer Councillor Wright a monthly meeting to update him on what's happening with the service. He refused that. I emailed him on the 1st of September to ask him to let me know when is the convenient time for him to meet. I've still not heard from him. The invitation is still open. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, I think the deputy leader is 
but actually brought into the debate, right? Um, uh, in order to uh, in order to understand the decision making process, but in order to to bring home to them the fact that the decision making process is difficult and requires compromise and requires lots of factors to be brought into account. So it's a way of instilling a certain sense of responsibility and maturity and actually engaging with them on many different levels. Um, so often young people actually just look at frankly what's in uh, like I said, personally or their immediate group. And we need to use this as an opportunity to actually um, uh, engage with them, as I say, on, on those different levels. So I think this would be welcomed. Um, uh, young people are highly variable, actually, in their, in their temperament, in their sense of responsibility, uh, and in the way and their commitment to the way they engage with society. So I would stress at the point of repetition that I would, we should use this as an opportunity to actually engage with them and to develop that sense of responsibility and their obligations to society. Because so often young people think that things come easily, that money uh, is there for the asking, and that things happen without any great difficulty. The, the fact is, it is not. And if we engage with them, we can bring them into that overall debate. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bridges. Thank you very much. Um, so, Councillor Cathcart is absolutely right that uh, young people are invariably alienated from um, politics, and local, local politics, and national politics. Um, and you know, we should be considering them as a hard-to-reach group, as we consider many other groups, such as the uh, disabled, the people with mental health issues, as as a hard-to-reach group. So it's very important that we are engaging with them. Um, I'm not going to support this because actually it's the wrong motion at the wrong time. So we are doing youth engagement. It is business as usual. That wasn't always the case. Um, when, uh, some, not many years ago, uh, Councillor Williams, before you were here, I was made the uh, member champion for, ch uh, for children and young people and vulnerable adults, actually, by the previous administration. Um, fortunately, that was taken away with me. Uh, I won't go into the reasons why. Uh, there was also a youth council at that time, uh, which I think Councillor Ellington had responsibility for, which was a jolly good piece of work, and unfortunately it was allowed to decline. Um, however, since, since then, youth engagement absolutely is business as usual. Uh, youth engagement is planned as part of the issues and options consultation, regular engagement with children and young people as part of the development of the new communities um, happens routinely. And I gather we insisted that young people and their parents were included in the North Stowe Play consultation for Phase 1 and Phase 2, including engagement with Long Stanton Youth Council. And we will continue to engage with young people through the development process for all the community facilities for North Stowe, which we now find ourselves responsible for. The Community Transport Business Plan, um, which is about developing a business case for the northern villages, will, will include young people because, of course, public transport, the main users, are the young and the not-so-young. You know, it's very, very important. It's tailored to their needs. We're looking at to see how we can better engage young people in regular growth area forums. And we host networking and information uh, meetings for youth, or, or youth organisations whenever we are asked. And the Try the Train Day is run by Melbourne and Shepherd Community Rail Partnership, as well as other activities, have engaged numerous young people. <coughs> I'm also aware that the Citizens' Assembly, which GCP in, um, conducted, involved 18-year-olds and above. And I know that many of our parishes who are involved on neighbourhood plans put young people at the centre of those plans because they're all about their futures. And us, I don't think there's many of us in this room who don't value the importance of our role in youth engagement. Um, so I was at Combaton at the, the invitation of their um, environmental group last Friday on the day that many other young people were striking. They invited me in so that I, they could tell me what I should be doing to help save their planet. Peter, can you wind up your remarks, please? Thank you. May I continue? Thank you very much. Um, I've also run a carers group, which involves children for the last 20 years. 
Perhaps with Derek Dalderfield is involved in the politics project with Sawston Village College and talking to scouts about democracy and she's been into Icknell Primary to talk about plastic reduction. Councillor Wilson's uh, been supporting young people dealing with travel to school problems. Councillor Henry Batchelor has been talking to his local primary school. Councillor Harvey took part in the climate strike with a group of young people. Councillor Dawson is a governor of Great Wilburham Primary and very engaged with young people. And, so, and I could go on and on and on. I doubt there are many of us in this room who are not stop nodding, and, uh, who are not engaged with young people. So there is responsibility for this council to uh, engage, which we are doing, and we have a, a responsibility as many of us. What I would be more interested, rather than a task and finish group, which will only serve to sort of reinvent the wheel of what we're already doing, is perhaps a review piece of work. Once the medium-term financial plan is in place and the priorities are all being delivered, a review in some months' time to make sure and check that we are being successful in the work we are doing with young people. I think that's far more productive than something which is starting from a baseline when actually we are already doing a tremendous lot but continue to be very ambitious to do even more. Thank you, and I hope all those councillors who named, whose names were mentioned will not feel that they now need to speak to this debate. <laughs> Councillor Van der Waal. I just wanted to make the observation that, uh, as far as I know, we aren't planning to build 70,000 homes uh, in our area um, uh, under any known time scales. Obviously, it's 19,500 in the local plan plus the uh, report site. And so, if uh, 70,000 homes, order, order. 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 South Council is a great area with 70,000 homes in the village. Uh, if I would like to propose an amendment, given that there, there is a possibility that this might have passed, um, to reduce that to 19,500 and reduce the property cap. Do you have a second? Thank you, Leader. Do you wish to speak now? Uh, no, it's a statement of fact. Yeah. Yeah. Can you take a vote on that? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say, I think that's time that was meant to be um, to do with constituents, residents, as opposed to homes with the new future local plan and the current local plan. So you accept that amendment? Um, I accept, yes. Thank you. Well, in that case, we don't need to vote on it. Uh, the motion is amended as stated. Um, Councillor Ellington. Thank you. As uh, I didn't put my name down to speak before, Councillor Richardson mentioned it, so I think I'm entitled. I did indeed set up the Youth Council with Councillor Topping uh, some years ago. And uh, it, it was good in parts. Um, it had a really interesting group of young people and they did get involved. And, and I felt that it was, is something that we ought to be looking at. Personally, um, it wasn't so good because the chairman got so involved, he's reading politics at Cambridge University and stood against me as a Labour candidate. <laughs> Generally, you know, I'm in accord with the proposal in terms of engagement. Uh, with two teenagers, I have daily engagement. And what's fascinating is how much they are engaged yeah. with politics right now. Uh, but we can't create a cause um, from uh, top down. We can't get them to do what they're not inclined to do. I don't think there is lack of information. It needs a catalyst like Greta Thunberg to come along. Uh, uh, to, to activate some of that latent uh, demand. Uh, and it comes much better from that group. So whatever we can do as a catalyst uh, to improve that engagement with uh, uh, the, the, the young, we don't have politics in the syllabus. It's, it's crazy. This, this, you know, I talk to people on the street, and you know, somebody in the council that says, I'm not interested in politics. And I'm standing for election as a district councillor who are providing your accommodation so she doesn't want to talk to So this, this, uh, this engagement that we have can be worked on 
I'm not sure that, that I can uh, go with this motion, but I definitely go with the principle behind it of increasing uh, engagement. So thank you for bringing it. So at least we've been having this discussion today. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Uh, most of what I was going to say has been covered by uh, Councillor Cathcart. I'd just like to say that you know, I support the motion. I think um, you know, this, this motion is to set up a task and finish group which will consider the best options for delivering uh, more youth engagement, and that has to be a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of the points that I was going to mention uh, have, have already been covered in terms of uh, the extension of the school strike. I think that you know, when you see Grace, I'm going to need to think of what Councillor was. Um, she, it's she's it's a leader, you know, she's a leader and she shines uh, in comparison to some of those that were parading at the UN this week. Um, the phrase hard to reach, I have a real problem with uh, it. I, I think, I think hard, hard to reach is, is, a, is a misnomer. I think it's a failure of, of either us or, or, the, or a charity or a statutory sector when we talk about hard to reach people. They're only hard to reach if, if we're not communicating properly. To do that, um, I think there is there are examples, maybe not of, of politics and cur curriculum, but at Campbell, I know from my own son's time at Campbell Village College, they ran a very successful political um, education course, which could have linked. And I did have, I think, I think it was Councillor Hart had a conversation with about that, and also about the video relaying of these meetings, and suggested that maybe that was a way that we could, we could involve people. Um, it depends who speak. Um, so I think there are opportunities to, to, to push the, the hard to reach um, phrase aside and just as somebody who's lived and raised two children in Campbell, I have to say, and I'm sorry Chair if this, if this comes across as a political point, but a plague on both your houses in terms of South Camps youth provision over the last uh, 20 years uh, that I've raised children in South Cambridgeshire, there still is no youth centre in Campbell. And for a new development like that, that is a Thank you, Councillor Toffey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess my opening remarks will be, well, what is the mischief, what is the problem that this motion is intended to remedy? And if you forgive me, a very long time ago, I did some work with uh, a chap called Tim Clement Jones. Um, now, some of you may know Tim Clement Jones because he's a little bit of a here. So, He's also bringing up district policy, which I think is a prerequisite for being a member of the We'll pass over. So one of the things that Tim did a long time ago as company secretary of a large retail outfit was to back a charity called the Citizenship Foundation. The Citizenship Foundation was making the point, as people have made earlier on today, that the curriculum has very little in it that explains to and encourages young people in terms of their responsibilities and duties as citizens. And some of the debate that we are having in other places yesterday evening, you know, may be a consequence of some of that lack of understanding of what it means to be a politician, counsellor, a leader, whatever. And what it seems to me this recommendation is trying to do is to say South Cambridgeshire is an aspirational council. You know, there was a youth forum, it was jolly hard work, as Councillor Ellington has said, but it also had people on it who were called princess. And she wasn't a princess, you know, she had aspirations to be. And I support that wholeheartedly. And so it seems to me that there is a level of, and I'm sorry to use this word about Councillor Smith because I don't I didn't believe that she was going to go down this line. Can you keep your remarks addressed to the motion before us, please? I believe that the litany of engagement that has been read out by the leader of the council is worthwhile, but that does not address the aspiration of what this motion intends to do. So I shall be voting. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't want to be in danger of uh, filling your streams. I know other questions can be got through, uh, other motions can be got through. I would just say that, actually, I think in reality there are very few um, young people who have got a real interest in politics. You know, something that's a real core thing to them that they're interested in from an early age. It's fine jigging off school for a day, I would all have to do that. Um, I would have loved to do that, I was never brave enough. Um, but in reality, there are only a certain amount of children, teenagers, who really want to understand politics. However, we're not even giving them the opportunity. I was lucky, I started school at 15. I joined a trade union at 15. I joined the Labour Party at 17. I was a secretary of a local ward Labour Party at 18. I went to actually part-time rallies. I went to um, political discussions. We used to have a lot of those when I was a, a teenager and in my early 20s, where you could go and see your local politicians. You could pick on them to their high heavens. It's great fun. But you could also listen and get information. Now, there's far a few of that now. I'm sorry, I don't get this pretty business. You know, she's here today, she'll be forgotten tomorrow. She will be forgotten tomorrow. Because, but we need, if we are going to be serious, if you, if you liberals, you're terribly liberal, if you Councillor Roberts, truly liberal, can you address your remarks to the chair and can you address them to the motion, please? My, my addressing to the uh, motion, chairman, is that if we are going to have these sort of values, which the authority now has in place, then it is up to us to go out there. You, you won't get a lot of young people coming here. Why the hell should they? But we need, we need to go and maybe have debating uh, discussions at colleges, things like that, where members of all the different parties and none can go and we can actually have a debate with students. But you're closing the door to that even happening. You're saying, we're doing great things already, we've tried things and they haven't worked, and so therefore we'll do no more at this stage. I think all that is being asked is, have a task and finish group, and see if there are new ideas that can come forward, and if they might work. Now, you might decide with the task and finish group, we're actually, we're not going to get anywhere here. It's not going to be interesting enough to youngsters, but you're not even giving them the opportunity. You know, let's give those children, for me, in time, because they've got a, a core interest in politics, some indication of what it's all about, their different chances and, and choices that they can make, but you're not going to get it by saying no to a simple task and pinch group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya. First of all, thank you, Councillor Smith, giving so many examples for the councillors, those who are working with the youth. I will be very happy if if Councillor Smith remembers, uh, if, if Councillor Smith remembers uh, my name as well, because I am also working 400 plus children, and I am teaching them the, I am also uh, teaching them the robotics, and you can actually see them from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Council building outside there, they are, they are making their robots there. But now the question is that I am supporting this motion because the question raised that children are not coming to the politics. So can I please ask this council to run a mock full council meeting engaging the A-level student, engaging the A-level student of our, of our district and to, and to run a mock full council. Are you proposing an amendment to the motion? No, I'm just, I, I'm just supporting, I'm just supporting that there's a proposal and, and, and if and if time to time we can we can take these children to the um, I mean we can take these children to the parliament too. So instead of instead of expecting them to come to the politics, we can actual, actually do them. Uh, we can actually do something um, for um, for bringing them to the politics. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to give an example of how, within planning, we actually already are engaging with young people. Um, I've 
I recently attended a day out in Cottenham Primary School talking to the kids about planning because there's a site there that's got, uh, it's going to be built out and we're actually designing the play area uh, that's going to be on the site. And you know, it, it's, it's an engagement that they were quite happy to do and I was quite surprised at some of the questions that they were asking. We talked to them about politics, about their local councillors, about how we can get engaged. And, you know, it might be that we can find new planners at that point. Um, I've even been to Portico Primary School, which is in my uh, village. Um, again, you know, they did a design for one of the uh, small play areas on the top. And again, I found that they wanted to know, we took it to them. And I think perhaps that's probably a way in which we can engage more in, it doesn't have to be a formal thing, just as part of the process of, you know, um, doing things here. Just as, you know, so. Thank you. Uh, Professor <coughs> John Williams, your comments, for your Contribution has already been noted. Do you wish to ask it and to contribute any more than that? Your, your contribution was made by the leader. Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, my name was mentioned. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, so very strange. Anyway, um, I, 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 I have some experience with this because um, when I was a teenager, I was a member of Woolwich Youth Council. And, um, and I also went on marches in school against the Vietnam War and against the start of the 70 term and to close Oxford Street to, uh, to traffic. Um, and the reason why I did those things was I was passionate about wanting to change things. Okay? The reason we don't get young people involved in politics until now, until the climate change, is because they are not interested to change things. And until we get young people interested in wanting to change things, we will not engage them. You know, no one wants to come along to a boring council meeting um, talking about issues that are not relevant to them, which is what happens most of the time in this council chamber. And to set up a task and finish group made up of uh, rather ageing councillors deciding what the youth really wants to happen in this district is not the way to engage young people in politics. To engage young people in politics you need to go out there and engage them in the things that are going to affect them. You know, things like congestion in Cambridge and our future of this planet. And I find it rather hypocritical that those very people who are calling for a task and finish group to engage the youth are the very people who have been criticising our young people for marching to save this planet. So, you know, let's, let's not have another meeting of councillors to decide what the youth wants. You know, we know what the youth wants go out and speak to them and they will tell you what they want this council to do. They don't want to get involved in the machinations of this council. They want us to take action. They want us to, to take action against climate change. They want us to take action against the, the reduction in our services, to improve their education, to make the world more equal. That's what young people want. They don't want us to set up another meaningless meeting of ageing councillors. <laughs> Councillor Hayes. I just want to say catch up. They do want to come in here and they came. They came to the Climate Change and Environment Committee. The History and Infington Eco Youth Panel asked to come. They came. They prepared one minute each to have a total of six minutes better than any of us can do in terms of the impact of a one minute presentation each. They wanted to come about the issues that they're passionate about. They want to be involved. Two weeks later, they went to their parish council, which had failed the month before to try and declare a climate emergency amongst the older councillors. 
They went there, took it by storm, and the parish council has now declared a climate emergency. They are now meeting with the next village to make sure their parish council... This is happening, and it's happening through planning, it's happening through placemaking, it's happening through our green agenda. We are energising and showing the youth that there is a reason to come here and that we can do things together. And they are shaking and rattling our their sabres at us. So I just think, catch up. It is happening, they are interested, they are here, and they're waiting to see what action we take having come here. I go this Saturday, and I present to them what we have done since they came and talked to us. They have asked me to come and be accountable to them since they came to visit us. They are political. And do you know how old these are? Between 8 and 10 years old. I observe, Franz, with what um, Councillor Hayling says that these young people, and it's admirable, they actually want to come and engage with our meetings. So we don't need to set up a separate youth council to, to plan it separately. We need to involve them in our meetings on a regular basis. Yes, go out and involve them in consultation, but yes, invite them to our meetings, because if what you're saying is so, and I'm sure it is, then they will be, make every effort to come along to our meetings. I have to make sure we make it possible for them to come in terms of timing. As far as timing is concerned, we are nearly out, so I'm now going to ask uh, Councillor Williams to sum up the papers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the words in this is greater involvement. As I said when I moved the motion, there's, there's no criticism here of what's currently happening. It's about perhaps seeing what is happening and capitalising and looking at ways to take it forward even more. It's not by any way, it's looking forward, not backwards. And do you know what? Many of the suggestions that have been made are good and valid suggestions that through a group such as this, we could challenge and um, channel them into making them a reality. It's a mechanism to bring them forward. And that's all work that is being asked for here, is that we try and take people forward and capitalise on that rare moment at the moment where people are more engaged, now the time to do it more than any. And just on the remarks about um, children on March, while I, I respect Councillor Roberts, that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the same for all of us as, as Councillor John Williams. Um, the issue of leaving school I think is an in, individual issue for, for many of us, but the actual demonstration and the engagement that they want to have is, is admirable and it is welcome, I think, and should be by all of us. Um, and this was seeking to build upon that. Um, thank you. Thank you. We will now go to the vote. If you support this motion, you will press the green button. If you oppose it, you will press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you will press the yellow button.
I'd just like to say my reasons for, for seconding this motion is that a lot of us as local council chairmen see the, the tug of war that sort of sometimes feels like it's going on where we are broken. We are trying to help support our residents but also appreciate the situation that you know the, the council finds itself in relation to, to planning and, and everything that surrounds that. And I'm very conscious that I receive a lot of emails and correspondence chasing where things are at in a process and all these sorts of things. So I can't imagine what it's like for officers. And really, this is a suggestion to help alleviate that pressure, to help manage expectations of residents, which, you know, they are what counts in everything that we do. And also, I would hope, would support officers in relieving that, that pressure of um, being chased quite often as, as if they do as much as I do, you know, then there's uh, improvement to be had. And this might help. That's all it sets out to do. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, to paraphrase the well worn phrase, information can be a dangerous thing. A lot of project management will be in a different sector where bare KPIs like this exposed to the wrong people can cause a lot of confusion um, and be misinterpreted. I don't believe this is the right way to expose this sort of information. What would be much more useful is uh, for members to be able to get better insights into the planning system. And I understand that the new portal is going to achieve this. And that's the way you should go to, uh, to improve the system. Uh, Dr. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I cannot support this motion. Um, whilst I understand the reason that it's been put forward, um, I think we already actually publish um, a set of KPIs in the quarterly report uh, that goes to Cabinet and Scrutiny. Um, and we also monitor um, the KPIs that the Ministry of Housing and Communities and Local Government actually measures uh, performance of. And that is actually published um, on the gov.uk website uh, as an annual statement. So that is already out there. But what this will do is just add more to the burden of work that um, our planners uh, already have. Now, if I can just say this, we already have agreed that scrutiny will um, look at the planning service at some point in time in the next couple of months, I think. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. And we are happy to come to that meeting, and you're welcome to come and attend, and actually ask your questions there. Um, no holds barred, you know. Um, and the fact that we're actually also going through a transition period means that we need to let this settle. Once we have our single process in place, then we can look at what other statistics that we can provide to help people understand where the service is at. But this isn't going to help at all. What you need to do is let the planning service get on with what it's best at, which is planning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very keen, but one of, one of the things that doesn't appear to be recorded is the amount of time between an application being received in this building and the time that a planning officer looks at it, i.e. the validation time. A number of people, people have raised concerns with me that they put in an application but they're still pending being validated and sent to a planning officer. And that can be eight, ten weeks, and that can add an enormous amount of time to the overall application process. And people need to know that they need to know when it's likely to happen at the end of the day. And if you're a builder and you've got your brakes, you need to know. So I would ask that that particular piece of information is very clearly recorded. Thank you, comes to the top. Oh, thank you, Chair. So, um, it's 
seems to me that the barriers are going up. It seems to me that this is a council that's imposing a decree of fog at night. You know, we're asking for some basic information. And it's information which all councillors will be able to use to clarify matters with the parish councils. And sometimes parish councils say, because oh, you know, it's, all, it's all going wrong. And actually being able to say, well, actually, no, it's not going wrong because here's the data would be enormously helpful, as Councillor Williams said at the beginning. But, you know, let us be clear. I mean, I've done some projects, and I can tell you <coughs> the way that you get improvement is you get the data on the table and you're able to drill into it. And the more people that can get into that data, the better. If you vote against this, you are fricked. I don't think print seems to have become the much more popular word than when Margaret Thatcher did it in Parliament all those years ago. I'll try and avoid stuff from up north. So, um, um, yeah. <laughs> order. Chairman, I, I hope I don't misrepresent you when I uh, cite you when you've asked in uh, committees uh, such as scrutiny uh, for oh, standard deviations. Part of the problem that we have with issuing raw data is it is exactly that. It could be misinterpreted and what we need is proper information. And actually setting expectations of, of, of how quickly uh, the planning service can be expected to respond, perfectly reasonable I think. So as, as we go forward with this new system, that's exactly what we should uh, but when um, we, we hear complaints of the uh, uh, terrorists, I think, in the third party, doing the triaging that you just asked, asked for, uh, sorry, which is it? Do you want us to get on and actually improve the situation for the users? So I, I think we just we need to act sensibly about this and improve and this. How is that? Continuous improvement. Get into the new system, get automatic production of information rather than manually producing data that can be hugely misinterpreted. So that's my uh, position on this. Thank you. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a few points with regard to uh, this motion, uh, which I'll be uh, voting against and like to explain why. First of all, Councillor Cohn, I don't recall, but he can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong, he ever really raising in the scrutiny committee questions about the KPIs that we look at. And, and I must say that the, the, the scrutiny examination of the planning KPIs can always be improved, but it's excellent, and Councillor Chamberlain, who chairs that committee, uh, does a really good job. So I'm very surprised he brought it up here and he's never raised it at scrutiny. Um, I personally take the KPIs that are at the scrutiny meeting put it in my parish council report, and it's discussed every quarter with my parish councils. And Councillor Topping knows that, because he's been at some of those meetings. So, where the barriers or lack of transparency, where the barriers, Councillor Topping, or, or lack of transparency, I really don't know where that comes from. And finally, I have to remind Councillor Topping that at the last meeting we were having a discussion about terror press that we will come on to, he asked the chairman to stop the discussion because we had homes to go to. And the chairman quite rightly said, this is an important issue and it needs to debate. So, on a matter of personal information, which meeting are you talking about, Councillor? The last scrutiny meeting. Well, I, I did not recall. Okay. But okay. it's a cheap shot, so keep going. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. And yeah. I, I'm supporting this. Um, and I've changed what I said because the leader, uh, the leader of the opposition has already made some of my points. But I just want to go back to the KPIs that go to scrutiny and how relevant they are to them, actually how well the planning service is performing. Unfortunately, uh, they, they agree quite well, but they don't represent what is actually happening. Because as the uh, planning time runs out, Planning officers are asking so many of the applicants 
for extensions to their plans, which as an applicant, you're terrified you know, you're planning to do so, so you readily agree to it. And that can happen once or twice during the applications, sometimes three times, as happened to me. Um, so that is personal experience. Also, when the it's a raft of applications come in. It's amazing how the validation slows down. So those figures are kept healthy. So perhaps what is suggested here, and a much better performance management ind indicator would be the number of applications that are actually open in front of the plants. That would be a true representation and you could measure it going up and down, whether it's improving and whether planning is dealing with it or not. And I have made that suggestion before. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Lovett. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Lovett, I'm actually agree that the most appropriate place for this is to look at these sorts of information and scrutiny so that we can um, uh, look into a bit more depth. Um, I'll take the two issues of validation that have been raised um, uh, just now. Uh, the, the information is most certainly there uh, and um, can be discussed at, at scrutiny. Um, for example, uh, the, the, this question of the length of validation, um, uh, I, my understanding is that the, 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 um, uh, that, that is the main issue there in a, in a, in a huge number of cases is that the applications are simply aren't valid. So uh, you, you need to then look in more detail at, at the reasons for the delays of validation. Uh, and another sort of technical thing, um, the, the, the time scales for uh, assessing applications actually start when, when the uh, valid application is received, not only when it's sort of confirmed and it's validated. So that this point about intentionally delaying, I think, is, is, a, um, uh, is a bit of a red herring. Again, if that is something that should be appropriate place for discussing that, is in scrutiny uh, when, when, when there can be some, some training of frame rather than just putting all the statistics up on the website. Absolutely. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, just earlier, the lead member for planning said that this information really exists and is put on one of the multitude of government websites. I wonder if it's not just the work of a moment to copy, paste and put on our own website. Our residents go to our website for information. They don't start searching government websites. Thank you. Thank you. Comes to talk to I would uh, refer members to the government website and uh, table um, P24A, District Planning Authorities, Planning Decisions by Development Type and Local Planning Authority. And it gives you exactly what you're asking for up until September of this year. So, you know, why are you asking us to do something which you can access yourself via your laptop or iPhone from the government website? Thank you. I have no more speakers. Uh, Councillor Kerr, would you like to sum up the debate? I haven't got much else to add that's already been discussed, other than that you know the motion was put there just to you know, make the council as transparent as possible. And if the information is already there, what's the harm in having it on our website? That's very much. Thank you. So we come to the vote. If you wish to support this motion, you will press the green button. If you wish to oppose it, you press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you press the yellow button. Has everyone voted? Can we see the results? Yeah. 11 voted in favour, 25 voted against, no abstentions, so this motion is lost. Our third item is in the name of Councillor Nick Wright. Councillor Nick Wright, please propose your motion. Thank you, Chairman. This is very straightforward. Um, it's asking for transparency again. Um, I, I think people who put in an application to our planning officers should have the right to know whether it's being dealt with by our planning officers or a private firm. Uh, simple as that. No, it, uh, I'm not against this private firm taking over. What I'm interested in is providing a good service to our residents. Um, it, it's helpful to private firm because we have this huge workload, and to compare that, you know, uh, I'm very grateful for officers supplying figures very quickly when the 
requested this week, the present current workload, there are 1,363 open applications on officers' desks, including free applications as well. If you compare that to what there was uh, when I was lead um, uh, member for planning, you know, we, were, we had a performance management figure of having 385 open planning applications. So that gives you some idea of the increase in the workload in five or six years. Um, I have to say that, that that was only achieved once and the planning department threw a party to celebrate that they had achieved getting it down to that figure. And it was remarkable. It, it was achieved and it sort of after that it averaged out to about 450. But setting a target it, that can be achieved as well it, it is great. And you know with TerraQuest doing this and helping our officers out, I'm sure that can be achieved. And what we're asking for with this motion is transparency, so applicants and councillors, parish councillors, all know who is dealing with the application. Uh, it's very simple. Um, when we've done it in the past, some of the work that we've outsourced um, has not been of the highest quality, and if the private firm does not come to scratch, I don't want to see our planning service tainted with that. Uh, so I say that with the experience of the past, and we've done it in the past, we, we, we've tended to use consultants rather than planning services or other local authorities to do our work. It's much harder for them because they don't live in the district, they don't know the district often, so the quality of their work is not often as high as our officers can achieve. Uh, so let's make it plain um, to our applicants and our residents who's dealing with it, and I hope you'll support this mission. Thank you. Do you have a second? Yes. Uh, Councillor Roberts, would you please speak, please? Yes, I'll speak now, Chair. Thank you. Those who've been in this council chamber for actually for a while will actually recall that I've not always been very supportive of the last administration where planning was concerned. Far from um, always supporting them. Um, however, I had great hopes um, when the administration changed that things would be better, done differently. We've slipped back again. Um, I'm very, very dissatisfied, as are my parish councils, at the thought that we, without being told about it, we suddenly discovered that a private contractor was being brought in for verification and assessment. That actual start is very important. So to find out that it was going to happen and we'd not actually been told about it uh, and, and informed and ask our views about it is somewhat alarming, to say the least. When it went to the scrutiny committee, and once again, um, we didn't really get it explained to us how it was imagined it was going to work. We got an awful lot of excuses uh, of why the system wasn't working, what was wrong, how many officers we were down, problems of getting uh, employees um, to come here, people to come here because of the pressures of the amount of money that the private sector. Well, I'm sorry, uh, that's up to management to sort out. We don't want excuses. People who are getting paid six-figure salaries or whatever should actually be coming up with solutions. And all we got told was, uh, these are um, these are the problems, and so we're going to um, we're going to take on. No, we're not going to sort it out. Okay? We're going to take on um, a completely uh, nebulous outside body. We don't know anything about. Most of us have never met. No idea who they are. We've no idea how many local um, people will be actually doing this solid publication because the firm is from miles and miles away up north. Um, you know, we know some members don't appear to think up north with any brains. So, you know, it's up north, but then I think it was well, it will be local people. Well, how many? And then also, we weren't really given an indica indication of which applications there would be uh, doing validation on. Um, would it be a, a house size of a house? Would it be the amount of houses that were involved, or the business, or whatever? It was just, well, some of them 
you know, some of them will just go to the outside people. And I'm sorry, I'm afraid it will be a great danger of it being a box-ticking exercise. Because how the hell, if we're so short of officers, how the hell are we actually going to check it? How are we actually going to... We haven't got the officers, it's been admitted, we haven't got the officers in-house to do their normal jobs. They can't do the verification. So, who's actually going to be checking this? What real validation is going to be made of the quality that we're going to get here? I have no confidence whatsoever because I'm not being given any information. I've just been given big excuses of why things aren't good here. Councillor Roberts, can you limit your comments to the actual motion before us? Yeah. Which is simply yeah, yeah, asking yeah. that uh, we should know when a TerraQuest employee is involved, etc. We should indeed. And we also should be knowing why they are being involved. I'm we sorry, are, that is not part of the motion. No, but I'm just, I'm just putting it across term to those who have the power that we don't, understand, we, we don't understand this because we've not been given any information. How can we um, understand uh, this verification and, and expect um, even to be told? Because even if we're told that it's going to be verified, um, by an outside organisation. We don't know what, under what ruling that's going to be, what, what measurements are going to be taken. I mean, this is a dog's breakfast. The department is now a dog's breakfast. You have, you have members... No, you have officers who are being undermined, and this is what it's all leading to. It's appalling. Councillor Bradford. As Councillor Roberts knows, we discussed this very thoroughly at Scrutiny and Open Group. We were not fogged off. We were given a very clear explanation that under the previous regime, we had had problems. Yeah. And so new solutions were being sought. These officers, who are just as well qualified as ours, as I understand it, will with the jobs will be allocated to case officers in this department. There may be some validation done by these TerraQuest staff, who are excellent staff and who run our portal. And none of the decisions, as I understand it, are likely to be made by TerraQuest staff, unless in consultation with our own officers anyway. This is a sensible approach to putting in extra resources that is needed, and I think it's a perfectly reasonable solution. We have no other speakers, so we'll go. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, I didn't see any hands. Uh, yeah. Councillor Khan. Sorry, I went there and comment. Sorry, sorry, I'd like to comment. I, I'm, in a sense, it might be a an interest. I'm a member of the Plan, World, World Plan Planning Institute, retired member, and so professionally a fan of myself. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, the clear implication of this uh, motion is that the, perhaps the people who work at Terrigas are less satisfactory, uh, uh, we should be worried about the uh, I would like to emphasize that these people will be professional planners. They will have signed up to a code of ethics. The code of professional Can I practice. remind all members, please, the motion is simply to ask that we know when they are employed. There is no issue about their competence in the motion which is before us. Can we restrict ourselves, please, to discussing the motion before us? It's implicit in the motion. I'd just like to point that out. Make that point out. Thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, the, while it may have been interpreted, Chair, by some members of that way, it does say it's a case of making it clear to applicants and those involved. If you actually look at the wording of this motion, it is to increase transparency, something that I suppose some of us naively hope is one of the things we can agree on in this chamber, is that we need to be as transparent as possible. And I think it's only right for the applicants, as much as the parish councils, to know exactly who is involved with their application. They get given a, a case officer that leaves it. 
The, there is no inferment on any employee of the tariff quest. It's just asking, it's asked, this motion is asking that people are made aware of who is dealing with the application. That, that is it, that is all that it seeks, that is all that it says. And I truly believe that there can be no harm done by being transparent in this matter. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if we're talking about transparency, can I just say, when this was done by a previous administration, we knew nothing about it. Okay? We knew nothing about it. Councillor Hawkins, can you stick to the motion? I can. I'm sorry, Chairman, I will. Um, by asking us, by asking the service to say whether or not it's a South Carolina approved officer or South Carolina employee officer or a contractor, um, it's not helpful. It is inferring that there is something potentially wrong with the work that these people are doing for us. We currently have contractors working for us in the service. Nobody knows who they are. What they are is case officer name, telephone number, four digits or six digits, whatever it is. That is it. And that is what will carry on happening. So I don't see any reason why we need to say to parish councils, presidents, applicants, wherever it is, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry, this person is um, terror person, this person is South Camps. In fact, at the parish planning forum meeting yesterday evening at 6 o'clock, this item was discussed. And the parish councillors and the clerks that attended asked the question, how do we contact them? And we explained this to them. I go, oh, that's all right then. As long as they have a case officer name and a case officer contact details, they are happy. So I'm afraid the people you are fighting for on their behalf have already said, we're happy with this. We just need to go on and get this done. It is transparent to them. They have a case officer. They have a way to contact the case officer. The final decisions, the final decisions on those cases will still be made by sometimes employed officers. What's happening is, Terraquest will take the early bit of them so they actually have time to do proper planning. That's what it is. Let's not make it a mountain out of this molehill. Let's let our planners get on with what they employ them to do. It's really to reinforce that point. I can't see that anybody's going to gain from such knowledge. The fact is, as soon as you say that uh, there are two different bodies involved, there's a differentiation. Some people may think that erroneously that you can get better service from one than the other, but how, how would you know? How would... It's, it's the planning service. That's all it needs to be. And there's a point of information. I'm from Leeds. Oh, no. oh, that's your problem. Leeds. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And we've been all round this. Very little has talked about motion. It is just a simple request. It's not going to cost maybe a massive amount of work. It's a simple request that applicants could be asked, could have the knowledge of who is dealing with their application. Simple as that. You know, it's all very well saying it's a case officer, but the case officer is handing on somebody else. Yeah. And the case officer then has to go right back and chase all the information out when there's a problem or it's amended. All the applicant needs is a bit of transparency and, and to know that it's being dealt with by Terraquest. I have nothing against that. I have nothing against Terraquest doing and helping out our officers. You know, it, it just makes absolute sense to be doing this. We're asking that applicants and residents have transparency of what is going on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We now move to the vote. If you wish to support this motion, you will press the green button. If you wish to oppose this motion, you will press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you press the yellow button. Has everyone voted? May we see the result, please, Patrick? Go 
are 10 votes yes, 25 no, and one abstention. The motion is lost. Councillor Topping, would you like to propose your motion? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to propose a motion. Um, I, I will, in proposing it, sort of just pause momentarily because all this froth and bubble could fall away. We've had a long afternoon to the backwards and forwards. I'm asking for a meeting, a seminar, an opportunity to do some challenge, ask some questions. Mm. If the lead member, uh, I'm assuming the lead is content, would say that even by a nod of her head or a wink of her eye, that she would be in agreement <laughs> with this motion, <laughs> then I would pause and sit down. But the answer, answer came there now. So I must continue. This council seems to have got used to the idea that one person <coughs> makes decisions. A few months ago, and I'm glad to see that saner and more sensible minds have intervened, the idea was that an investment decision of some 20 million could be taken by one person. Absolutely. And here we have the same thing again. A matter of great concern to our residents, the five-year lands decided by one person out of the meeting. And my point is that I don't want to see the five-year land supply disappear. We all know, those of us who were here before 2018, how difficult it was for parish councils. And indeed, you know, you made a big deal of this. I so to see you, please make sure that you all so, so, so I am concerned, and I believe many people should be concerned, that the council's own data shows a reduction in five-year land supply from 6 to 5.3. Now, if that is a trajectory that is going to continue, then we should be wrong. And so I'm asking, simply, for a seminar, with the director of planning, who is, who is the people. And it must be very difficult for you this afternoon. I'm sure you wanted to say an awful lot, but you know that's that's the way it goes. Right? Um, so a meeting, you know, for you to set up, for you to grace us with your presence, uh, we can have some questions, we can test the risk assumptions. Uh, that's all I ask. And if you say no, then you say no. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Do you wish to speak now? Yeah. I have no speakers at the moment. Councillor Wright, would you like to close the discussion? Uh, I will be brief, Chairman. Um, I, I do second this. You know, in the space of uh, 18 months, we've seen the um, five year last pie plummeting rapidly um, from 5.8. 5.8 to 5.3, I know 5.3 is a margin of probably 400 houses, but when it's declining that rapidly, developers are sharpening their knives and their pencils. So, uh, this isn't asking what you're going to do about it, although we'd like to know um, how you're going to deliver more houses, how you're going to speed up the planning process, and all of that. This is just a simple question. But putting the minds of this council together, as the lead, as the uh, leader of the opposition suggested, working together to come to a sensible solution to help this matter forward. So I ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Topping. I think all I can say is that Councillor Wright has summed up very accurately. go to the vote. Councillor Hawkins did not uh, signal her intention to speak until I had asked them for the, uh, the second to, to wind up the debate, so I'm sorry I cannot allow you to speak. If you wish to support this motion, you will press the green button. If you wish
wish to oppose it, you can press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you can press the yellow button. Has everyone voted? Let me see the result. Councillor Heather Williams. 
Thank you. Um, numerous, numerous energy um, and efficiencies and different net zero targets and all these things that, that normally we have Council Pippa Hayden to chair, talk so passionately about and, and time and time again we have supported, supported these motions. It is something that matters deeply. However, and there is a however and I'm sorry to say that, with onshore wind, if there's a change in the national policy, there's potentially a change in here in South Camps, and that's, that's a realistic view. And if that was to happen, I would not be serving my residents well in voting for this, having seen the controversy, the upset, and that that potential has caused locally when it's been mooted and proposed before. So, on other issues, Chair, you know, more than happy to support when it comes to meeting that target. But I'd be doing a disservice to my residents, given what happened last time, if I was to vote for this motion. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I um, actually support this motion. The, uh, when the government policy was changed in 2015, there was a 94 percent drop in applications for onshore wind, a huge drop. So a pipeline of, of sites is now empty where it should be full. Um, there was a freedom of information request by a group called DSMOG UK regarding that policy, which found that no proper impact analysis was done in terms of carbon reduction, energy cost, energy security, and really important topics like that. It only considered these local issues alluded to by Councillor Williams just now. So I think it's uh, given the, the huge support referred to by the movement of the motion, for this type of energy and the very core support for alternatives that secure uh, energy, uh, such as fracking, which is supposed to have 12% of the people, I think it's absolutely right that we should take the action here and uh, write a rep make representations to the central government to get this policy changed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bridges. Thank you. Well, I consider myself very fortunate that I have the only community wind turbine in South Cambridgeshire in my village. Million pound project. The only the investment all came from local people and local businesses, and so the beneficiaries are entirely the residents of Gambling Gay. It also provides enough electricity for a hundred homes, and it pays a tithe back to the village of about seven thousand pounds a year, which are invested in green infrastructure. And all sorts of different village groups have benefited from that. So I'm also now the political lead on the environment for the Oxford Cambridgeshire Arc, and I will be at a meeting of all the leaders of the Arc tomorrow. And at that meeting, I will be talking to them about opening up the Oxford Cambridgeshire Arc for onshore wind, because it is the cheapest form of renewable energy now. And it's all very well to say that one wouldn't be representing one's residents well, but actually, have we had those conversations recently with our residents? It's a different world now from whatever the last time was. We've had a passionate speech today from Councillor Halings about how much this matters to young people. And actually, the people we should be asking are our young people. Do, you know, do they object to wind power, which actually might be part of the solution to the destruction of their planet, which every day we hear more and more about, and which becomes more and more terrifying every day? So we've got to draw a line on the, under the past, and we've got to start making our decisions based on today and people's views today. And actually, I would not be serving my residents well if I did not approve something that might save this world for us and for our children. Thank you, Chairman. I have to admit that I've been having an extra week of eggs for breakfast every day this week, building up for this uh, uh, debate. I actually became a, a councillor to oppose a wind farm on my doorstep, uh, and the council has been here 17 turbines uh, between a uh, very pretty area, uh, and thank goodness it was turned down by the inspector and everybody else. Um, since then, I've been involved in the committee on the, the wind farm near the Six Mile Bottom, which I think has been a success. It's very bare up there, there's very few people who live near it, and 
Sorry. Order. Would you just continue? Thanks, Councillor. You know, I was uh, happy to support that at the time. Um, and that, that went through on appeal. Um, but uh, also, we had a wind farm built uh, next to my ward by Huntingdonshire, and that has caused problems. It is very close to one of my villages and has caused problems ever since. Even after six years, my email list uh, as Councillor Handley will uh, confirm is going through regularly with complaints every week about the noise and the AM and the vibration coming from these turbines. So it's, it's not a case of just building, we have to build them in the right place. And they have to be built with community support. I don't disagree, you know, I think it's great what we've done in Gambling Gay. Not, unfortunately, it's not being replicated anywhere else. But wind farms, no. Community supported ones, yes. And in the right place. So, you know, it's like all planning issues, it's the right thing in the right place at the right time. So, I have to say, I'm not happy with this. I think even two turbines is too much because of the noise and disturbance. Particularly in South Camps, I have no direct, no opposition to them over the rest of the country. No, I want to see these. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, if we were, you know, if people were really sincere about this, We'd see them shooting up in Cambridge, you know, on industrial estates um, and places like that. You know, how many do we see? None. Against main roads, excellent places for wind turbines. None. You know, there, there are opportunities, um, but it depends. You, you can't just say, grant, you know, two willy nilly against houses and that sort of thing. No. But against main roads, that sort of thing, possible. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, because I've been here forever and a day and I was here when the art was made, um, I do re remember very clearly some of the discussions about wind farms and how unhappy people were about them. What worries me of this is this trying to impose things on our residents without checking with them. I'm uh, sort of, of uh, what Bridget has happened in Bridget's parish. Uh, but I do remember that there were people in that parish who were happy about it originally, but seemingly they've calmed down. If a parish wants to and residents want to do something themselves, and they, they, they're supportive of that, that's fine. But come on, let's stop this totalitarian desire to impose what you think is right on everybody else. Because, I'm sorry Bridget, these wind farms are not going to save the planet. They're not even going to save South Cambridgeshire. What will save the planet is industry, who will come up with good ideas. And actually, one of the things that we will live to regret is the destroying of the coal-fired um, power stations in this country. Because if we only put more effort into looking out for better ways of producing electricity by coal, we would have had a lot better result. The answer is not in this. The answer is in nuclear power. It is in nuclear power. That's why size will... Councillor Roberts, can you control. restrict yourself, please, to the motion which we are discussing? Um, yes, I will. Thank you, Chairman, for reminding me of that. Um, so, why are we thinking that we can send something to... Uh, a Minister of State, when actually we've got no evidence whatsoever that it has got the support of our villages, our parishes, our parish councils. It's, it's totally unacceptable. Please stop. Please stop forcing people, because you think it's a good idea to have all these things in their, in their parishes. Have a discussion. Have a discussion. I'm sorry that Toomey is so very disinclined to have seminars here, but we can all sit around and talk about the things that worry us, because maybe this is one of the things that could. But you're just pulling things out of the hat. You're just demanding of things. It's not the council I joined. It's actually you are trashing the public. Councillor Toby. Can you switch over? 
Sorry. So, uh, I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that on, on Twitter, Extinction Rebellion followed me. That's what I followed, that's what I followed. And, you know, I, you know, Councillor Haynes and I have spoken many times about zero carbon aspirations. And indeed, you know, last year I was pleased and happy to support that um, proposal that came to this council. But, you know, and you know, I think two meetings ago the leader sort of, sort of said, well, you know, we must all work together. And I perhaps impersonally reminded her that, you know, working together requires a level of goodwill. And you've seen, Chair, a couple of motions this afternoon, which are, you know, earnest in their endeavour, and are not on school. I admit freely that some of them are on school. Let's not have any hiding about that. But some of them are not. And the administration has, as you, you know, put the strengthens on people, and all been voted against. So there is very little goodwill, and you know, I'm. Perhaps, you know, the new, <coughs> chair, new chair, chief executive of the council might reflect on how difficult and how bad tempered some of the discussions were. Councillor Topping, can you address your remarks to the motion? I will. I apologise, Chair. Um, so, on this issue of onshore wind, I personally do not believe that in a place like South Cambridgeshire, that onshore wind is something that is going to make a huge difference. In Wales, in Scotland, in the Peak District, um, in Northumberland, I see many wind farms, of course, and they're absolutely fine. The Sun Cambridgeshire, which is, you know, which is, has a lot of villages on next week, this proposal is a step too far. And so therefore I will be Thank you, Chair. We have two real assets. Um, Councillor Topping's own contribution to onshore sure wind. And Why young people are getting 
interest in politics. Um, there's no imposition in this. Actually, the scope of the um, motion from Councillor Harvey is quite simple. We're talking about small-scale onshore developments. Um, there's no imposition. It's modest in scope. Uh, it's not taking anything away from the planning process. And um, this uh, should be supported. I actually agree with quite a lot of what Mr. Councillor Wright said earlier. Um, wind farms in the wrong place do cause a lot of angst, a lot of grief. And I can tell you when the wind's blowing by the number of emails I get in the morning. So, yeah, let's have them in the right place. We want them small in scale. They are a solution and we should support this motion. I'm just really disappointed and I, I think I'm surprised um, it's all been zero carbon but that's what we just heard yes zero carbon but we can only do this. We are looking now at research that the Climate Change and Environment Committee heard this week. If we want to build this number of houses in South Camps, we have to look at all the alternative ways of producing green energy. Wind is one of these, and Councillor Wright, absolutely, in the right places, by the roads, urban areas as well, the right, the small ones that we do. Do you know why they're not being done? Because this government didn't let them be constructed. It took that out of the planning process. It left it only up to neighbourhood plans is the only place that allocation can be made, rather than the proper planning process, which would have allowed it to happen along roadsides and in urban areas. So all we're saying is bring it back into the centre of the planning process. Bring it back as an evidence-based piece of green energy where, and I know it's not totalitarian because I love sitting alongside Council Roberts in planning committees where we know that is not totalitarian. There is evidence, there is a democratic process around important strategic and controversial planning applications. I think the tide has changed. A public opinion around this, based on evidence, has changed. And my God, in South Kansas, yes, this is a place where we can have both solar and wind energy and all other types of green energy too. And I really do plead with Councillor Topping and Councillor Wimper, with whom I agree on these things, that we can't have an enthusiasm on this one. Let's have evidence based planning for where they can be and where they should be within South Kansas, otherwise, we will not. Meet our zero carbon target. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Chair. The requirements that we are building for electricity is growing to a pace that our current system absolutely has no chance of achieving. The average use of electricity in a household will increase by some tenfold if you have electric cars to each house. No capacity um, availability right now to even approach that. That's without the 2015 ban on uh, gas uh, in uh, heating in homes. So 2025. If we don't start building this production now, we're just going to be too late. We could build them in the, in the fence, perhaps, because if we don't do anything else. Those fans will be underwater, so they'll be offshore. And we can't be in this. I think uh, Gavin, Councillor Clayton, su suggested we can take them back down if we don't need them anymore. We can't build and take down a nuclear power station. I mean, we already see the problems with, with that. Coal production, I mean, this is Trump, I mean, please. You know, this is just crazy stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's ignorant beyond compare. We need to be able to act. And this is just a very small step in that. You think you know everything. You think you know everything. Order. Please continue. This is a very small step. 
and I recommend it to the council. Thank you. Councillor Bycroft. Thank you, Chair. So I wasn't actually planning to speak on this, but after hearing what uh, Councillor Roberts said, I think uh, it's important that people should know that uh, there are not all people on the right of politics are opposed to the environment. And I find it very disturbing when people actually make speeches about how good coal is and about how we should be really you tell them. You tell them. Can, can we restrict ourselves you tell to them the to motion, the please? So, um, the, uh, well, just, just on the theme of coal, we last year uh, only generated 5.4% of our electricity using coal. And that is down from. Councillor Bailey, can you restrict yourself to the motion, please? So, in terms of uh, wind farms in South Indonesia, um, our position really is we want to uh, preserve the environment. And the environment is both uh, preventing climate change, but it's also protecting our beautiful green fields. So, when members uh, of my group are talking about wind farms, what we're really saying is we want to live in a beautiful, uh, open countryside which is unspoiled. And one, one of the things that sort of disturbs me is. Your... One of the things that disturbs me about this debate is that we haven't talked about the other things that are damaging our countryside. For example, the fact that we have in our electricity grid, we have gigantic um, uh, towers carrying wires overhead. And what I'd really like to see in this debate is us talking, well, how can we remove these terrible things, uh, visual pollution from our environment? How can we somehow get uh, electricity providers to actually start pulling down these uh, transmission wires and start burying them underground? So my policy on onshore wind is that we should uh, be using this as an opportunity to actually rid our environment of the, uh, the electricity uh, piles that we currently have. But I, I want to just also say that uh, I don't know if um, members saw the news last week about offshore wind, the fact that the price is achieved in the, uh, uh, the auction, I think some of them were as low as 40 pounds per megawatt hour, are actually the lowest we've ever seen for, for off, offshore wind. And really, the long term solution is that it will be economically viable to build wind turbines offshore. Councillor Bicot, will you stick to the point, please? Yeah, so what I'm saying about that is that offshore and onshore wind are competing with one another in exactly the same way that coal and onshore wind are competing. And in a very short space of time, we will be able to build uh, offshore turbines that are economically completely viable. And if you now conclude your remarks, please. All other forms. Councillor Bycourt, can you conclude your remarks, please? Uh, of course, thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to ask uh, Councillor Khan to make his contribution. We have about two minutes left. Now, I don't, uh, I want to simply comment. Um, most of the points in favour of uh, what we should be developing like, uh, renewable energy have been put and the, the, the need. I'd like to comment that basically, renewable, uh, onshore wind is one of the few forms of energy which is effectively a budget ban. And this seems to be most unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. Normally, any form of, you have the right to apply to any form of development is considered on its merits. We're not proposing here that we should have a nearly, very really nearly uh, approach to wind farm. We're proposing that we should have wind, small, small scale wind, uh, wind turbines. Uh, Assessed under the normal planning procedure. Uh, this has effectively not been occurring for the last, uh, for the last four years. And there's no obvious reason why it shouldn't be. It cannot be justified through planning procedures, but they would go ahead. We think this is a simple way of making our contribution to winter, uh, to the renewable energy. Okay, offshore wind to the turbines are very economic. Onshore wind is even more economic. It's cheaper than offshore. It, been abandoned simply because uh, on the national scale, which doesn't seem to be to us to be in any case to be just in I would therefore suggest that people, uh, put forward to people that I hope they would support this 
which seemed to be a simple motion to try and produce a, a positive change in our local environment. Jim, uh, in good time, I'm very happy to sum up very quickly. First, to say we are not talking about wind farms, we're talking about small onshore turbines. Uh, secondly, we're not talking about something which is competing with offshore. Offshore is developing very effectively, and the two are complementary. And the third thing is the, to pick up, and I, I suppose much of what Council Popping says, my concern was the, the statement that this isn't going to make much contribution in South Cambridge. We're talking about zero carbon in South Cambridge. We have to do what we can to reduce our own emissions, to make our own contribution, and to ensure that we're not just relying on others, particularly offshore, because we can't do much about that in South Cambridge. So with that, I will seek to uh, conclude the Thank you very much. If you approve the motion, you will press the green button. If you wish to oppose the motion, you will press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you will press the yellow button. Has everybody voted? May we see the result? They have voted 26. 26, I'm sorry, my eyes are not very good. 26, yes, to 8, no, and no abstentions, so the motion is carried. Thank you very much. We come to the final item, item 12. You are asked to note the engagements carried out by the Chairman and Vice Chairman since the last Council meeting, as on page Roman 5. However, there are two additions to note. Firstly, on the 8th of August, the Vice Chairman attended the funeral in Land Beach of Alan Wyatt, the erstwhile chair of South Cambridge District Council, and on the 6th of September, the Vice Chairman attended the Fenland District Council Civic Reception at East Street Community Centre. Thank you. That